over to you. So, um, Lord, we just thank you for Marcus. We, um, yeah, we thank you for uh, the incredible gift that he has when he shares your word. We thank you that, um, because I know Marcus, um, I know that he spends a lot of time and uh, thought and really, really um, works hard to ensure that he is representing you and your word, Lord, as he comes to share with us. So we thank you for that. And we pray that um, you bless us in these words that we'll learn tonight. And again, we pray, like always in the evening service, that um, that we leave change. So we pray in Marcus's preaching this evening that it is some, that just plants a little seed in us that we will leave here um, changed with new understanding of you, with new thought of you. Um, and we just bless Marcus for taking the time to come and share with you share with us this evening. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, even though there's a few of us, we're still going to start in the way that I planned. So um, I'm going to start off our time this evening with a question. So you do need to turn to a partner. You do need to give them your answer to this. Um, but say that you are going away on holiday um, and you had to entrust something that you cared about, your business, your pets, your houseplants, your children, if you're lucky enough to hand them away to someone else. Um, what qualities and characteristics would you seek in that person? Go. All right, if you want to start shouting them out, that'd be useful. Love a bit of feedback. Trustworthy, reliable, good. I thought of that one. <laughs> Trustworthy, reliable. Someone like you. Oh. <laughs> oh, fantastic. We love that. Well done, Andy. Good. What a star. Anything else? Good listener. We like that. Anything else? Someone said loyal. You heard loyal. Okay. Well, you might have said something like trustworthy, faithful, reliable, adaptable, teachable. Um, whatever it is, there are good qualities and characteristics that you are wanting from that person. Um, and this evening, we are going to be reading the parable of the tenants, which in some translations is also called the parable of the wicked vine dressers, where a landowner rents out his vineyard to some farmers, and they don't particularly show any of those qualities or characteristics um, that we just spoke about. So, uh, to set the scene, Jesus and his ragtag group of disciples have been walking around Israel for the past three years, preaching the gospel to the poor, healing the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaiming the favor and the grace of God. And to sum it all up, he's been explaining to them what the kingdom of heaven is like, mostly through stories, some of which we've already covered, um, and showing them the way to bring it to earth. Uh, and they've been close enough to be covered in the dust from his sandals, much like my Jesus sandals, as Josh likes to call them. Uh, and they've been learning the unforced rhythms of grace. And it started to click for them, with some declaring that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's at this point that we get to the climax of the story, the Passion. So Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, if you're at the weekend away, you'll remember the story. Coming in through one gate of the city as Caesar comes through another, courageously demonstrating that he is the king and that this will be his crowning moment. And the multitudes, by and large, get that too. Um, they've finally seen who this man is, crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And at the start of the week, he cleanses the temple because it's been turned into a marketplace, overturning the tables of the money changers and asserting his royal authority. He felt that the temple had been compromised because of the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. And so naturally, they're deeply offended. They tried to trap Jesus and shame him in public debate. And this is the part where we pick up the story. So if you've got your Bibles, um, then turn with me to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, starting in verse 23. And we 
reading from the NIV, if you care. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John is a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. In classic Jesus style, he says, what do you think? And he tells them two stories, the parable of the two sons and the parable of the tenants. So we'll skip down to verse 33, and he illustrates where his authority is from. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. We'll finish there. So it's quite a stinging critique for the Pharisees. They are expecting a victorious Messiah who's going to deliver, uh, de deliver them from evil and defeat the pagan oppressors, and they won't recognize Jesus as the suffering servant, as Matthew is trying to point out to them. In this story, Jesus is telling of the history of Israel up until this point, where there will be a new way back for God in the future. He's reusing a parable written in poetic form at the start of Isaiah 5. And as Tom Wright summarizes, it is about God planting Israel like a vineyard, watching over it, hoping for good grapes, and finally discovering wild grapes. Israel had gone to the bad, despite all of his care. All that is left is judgment. The vineyard will be broken down, and wild animals will come and take over. It is a terrifying picture of what happens if the people of God persistently reject the purpose for which God has called them. So, let's go through the story step by step. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. And in the beginning, God planted a garden. It all seems very similar, and you can see how the arable imagery matches up. The whole story starts in the Garden of Eden, and it ends in the Garden City. And if we take the reading of Genesis that the earth became formless and void, possibly after the fall of Satan, then this garden was an outpost of the kingdom, and humans were given a purpose in tilling the ground and taming the wilderness around them, bringing the chaos back into order and expanding the kingdom. Next, the landover put a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it and he built a watchtower. And God takes meticulous care of the garden. And I've learned over the past few weeks that there's a lot that goes into horticulture. Because um, Josh and I recently became the happy fathers to three baby plants. We've got Spyro, the umbrella tree. You guys are hearing all about this at the weekend away. Lilibet, the peace lily, and Maria, the mother-in-law's tongue. No guesses as to where the last name came from. Um, and they take a lot of hard work. We've got to water them with the right amount of water. We've got to feed them with a special baby grove thing, whatever it's called. Uh, Repotting them so they've got enough space. 
and not too much space. Uh, so do, some odd people even say that you've got to talk to them. And then there's the soil. And um, I really hope that our parenting styles aren't shown through to care for our... Get a dog, yeah, I should have done really, a lot easier. Um, yeah, I really hope our parenting styles aren't shown through our care for our houseplants because um, I wasn't feeling too great. Josh spent hours looking at the soil. So he was searching through Google, finding the soil that was 50% uh, non-peat, 20% charcoal, 5% clay, and whatever else there was, probably magic pixie dust or unicorn hairs, or I don't know. Um, and he found somewhere where you could buy this custom soil for about 50 quid a bag. And each of our plants, of course, needed a different bag of soil with a different mix. Um, and there was me having to spend five quid tops on an all-purpose compost. So thankfully, that's what we did. But God is a lot more like Josh. He's got, I did say he'd go to hell last sermon, so uh, there we go. God is a lot more like Josh. He's got it all nailed down as to how it's all meant to be and how, what we need to flourish. So perhaps the walls symbolize the free will that we had to do anything favorable, anything good in the garden with the boundaries that we were not to step outside of. There's a watchtower because there would have been some threats of attacks from wild animals and the top of this tower would have served as somewhere to scour the area for elements of danger and do something to defend the crops. It also shows, though, that God expects a harvest. I was researching and found that the lower floor of the watchtower would have been made of a thick layer of untreated stone, which would have kept the area cool as a storage space um, for the crops during the harvest. So God was expecting not only that there'd be a harvest to reap, but also that there'd be enough that he'd have to store it away to stop it fermenting. And I've also spent far too long on Google looking at fermentation. Anyway, once picked, um, he, he doesn't want the grapes to go bad. And he wants the best for us. As the landowner digs a wine press, so too God expects that we will not only bear fruit, but also produce the most amazing wine as a result. The next part of the story tells us that the landover, landowner rented the vineyard to some farmers. And the farmers in the story represent the chief priests and the Pharisees. And at the point Jesus is speaking, they were responsible for the spiritual formation of the people, particularly in regards to their following of the Torah. The story also says that the landover moved to another place. Um, that largely reflects the situation of the time. There were lots of large estates in Galilee and um, they were all owned by lots of distant land landlords. So um, Jesus is simply using that as part of his parable. But I do question how much that also shows about our relationship between God and the people after the fall. He's not walking with them in the fall of the garden, but he gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts because they'd exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped created things rather than the creator. Thankfully, he doesn't just abandon the garden and let it grow wild, but he establishes a system of sacrifice and offerings whereby there was a way back. The custom of the time was that the landowner could expect as much as half the grapes as payment by the tenants who met at the time. And so when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect the fruit. Now, the servants sent are the prophets sent by God because Israel had fallen a long way from where God wanted them to be. After the exodus, they'd asked for judges and then kings. And because of all the evil done in the sight of the Lord, they were sent into exile. There were some good points, but for the most part, the Old Testament doesn't seem great, and the results are pretty bleak. It's only a few pages to the right of the creation story in Genesis that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. We read at the end of the book of Judges that in those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. We see in the book of Jeremiah that they'd built the high places of, of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something God did not, to, not command or mention, nor did it enter his mind. God is the rejected lover in the story, and out of his love he gives us what we want, no matter how. And we see that Israel's response to God's attempts, to the servants that he sends, are violent 
selfish, they're full of pride and arrogance. But sometimes, no matter how much effort you put in, things don't go well. God puts an awful lot of effort in. Um, I didn't tell you earlier about a fourth house plant that Josh and I adopted into our family, which is a Venus flytrap that doesn't even have a name yet. Um, it's so new. But despite our best efforts, all of the care and attention, mostly the care and attention that Josh put in, um, mites got into the soil and one branch went black and now it's spread to the rest of the plant. So in a last ditch attempt, Josh uprooted it, cleaned the soil off, cut off the dead roots and replanted it in the hopes of saving it. And when I left this afternoon, there were two green leaves that weren't fully black. So uh, we'll see what happens. But there's no snappy thing, whatever you call them. Um, in the same way, God sacrifices everything. He puts all of the effort in. The landover had sent the servant after servant after servant until there was only one person left for him to send, his son. We see throughout the history of Israel that God is always in relentless pursuit of us, chasing us down. It's a reckless plan that leaves him hurt again and again. And after it all goes wrong, the father sends Jesus. Whether the people listening in the temple would have understood the indirect claim that Jesus was making about being the son of God is uncertain. But they would have heard the stories about his baptism, about the voice from heaven saying that this is his son in whom he's well pleased, or the confirmation of all of that at the transfiguration. And in the other accounts of the parable in, in Mark and Luke, the emphasis is on the love that the father has for his son. The Greek word used is agapathos, which is the ag adjectival form of the noun agape which as one writer defines is a compassionate commitment to delight in the soul of another and to will that person's good ahead of your own, no matter the cost to yourself. Even after all of the awful things that the, father, the farmers have done, the landowner doesn't claim his land back, he doesn't fire them, he doesn't replace them, he makes a sacrifice in sending Jesus and he still thinks the best of the religious leaders. He's confident that they will be shown that he will be shown respect. And there's something cross-shaped in the heart of God throughout Scripture, something pointing towards the cross throughout the whole of the Hebrew Bible. But I do wonder if he imagined the extremity of it, the brutality of it, the torture and the pain and the suffering that would be inflicted upon Jesus. I wonder if he imagined the vitriol and the contempt and the hatred that the gospel would be treated with. Because the farmers planned to kill the son and take his inheritance. Jesus was obviously predicting what would happen on Good Friday with his crucifixion. And even though they didn't accept his claims to be the son of God, there was something clearly that the Pharisees saw that posed a threat to their power, corrupt as it may have been. And in certain conditions, um, the property of a Gentile or a proselyte like this vineyard who died without making a will, would pass to the first person who gained possession of it. Um, so the farmers may have been relying on some such custom, or they were simply hoping that the landowner wouldn't follow up on their action. So they planned to kill the heir and sit tight on the property, claiming some kind of squatter's rights. And the Pharisees may have heard some of the teachings of Jesus, maybe even some of the parables about the kingdom of God as well. And they would have seen that the new way of doing things was dangerous. They didn't want him to shake up their system of sacrifices and applying mercy and grace to the whole thing because the way things were, it benefited them. So they chose not to listen. They still planned to arrest him at some point because they were fearful of the revolution he might have brought. Jesus then asked the people listening what the landowner should do with the tenants. He's not satisfied with their answer completely, but instead of an explanation, he gives them a quotation from Psalm 118. He says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the same psalm that the excited worshippers were singing about when he arrived in the city just a few days before. And the psalm's all about going up to Jerusalem to worship in the temple in the presence of the Lord. And the key part that Jesus is drawing upon is the description of the architecture of the temple. When it was built, all the stones were put into place, but the builders had one stone that didn't appear like it was going to fit anywhere. In actual fact, that was the cornerstone or the capstone, as some translations say. The stone at the very summit of a corner or an arch, a crucial piece. And Jesus knew that he was going to be rejected. He knew 
but the Pharisees would miss the point. He knew that they were blinded to seeing him as the rightful heir to the vineyard. He knew they wouldn't recognize him as king because they were expecting him to look very different indeed. But Jesus also knew the authority that he had been given. He knew his place as the cornerstone in the building of the temple. He knew that without him, everything else would fall down. And he knew that it wouldn't look like, that it would look like, sorry, that it wasn't needed. He knew that on Silent Saturday, his followers would be upset and angry, questioning why they gave up everything to follow in his footsteps. But he knew that on Resurrection Sunday, he would be raised from the dead. He knew that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we'd be able to see that the Father was behind it all, that we'd see the grace, that grace wins and be able to say that it is marvelous and glorious. The landowner took back the vineyard um, in the same way that God took it from the chief priests, and he seems to remove the position of farmer. He doesn't really mention who, uh, who the new tenant's going to be, but if anyone is the tenant, it's surely Jesus, um, and the inheritance is his. But the landowner does give the vineyard to a people, he says, who will produce its fruit. In this new system, with love and grace applied, the Jews are not the only ones who get to partake in the inheritance. It's the Gentiles too. It's you and me. And as Jesus had said before, they will be known by their fruits. We will be known by our fruits. The church would germinate out the seeds planted during Jesus' life, and after his death, by his spirit, it would continue to grow and thrive. And you may be asking, well, so what? Because this parable is very specific to the context. It's spoken by Jesus during the week of the Passion to the chief priests and the Pharisees. And so you may be questioning how it all applies to us. I'd like to suggest that as we're all Gentiles, the fruitfulness of the vineyard is now our responsibility. And as we read through the rest of the lead up to Jesus' death, we can also sometimes see ourselves in the Jewish leaders, baying for blood, and calling for Pilate to crucify him. So, there's some questions for you to think about. At different times in your life, how have you received Jesus? How do you receive him now? How do you make Jesus feel welcome in your life each day? Um, And what actions of yours might make him feel unwelcome? In what ways is Jesus the cornerstone or the capstone in your life, holding everything together? In what ways is he not? And why might that be? Um, As you go away and reflect on some of those things, it's not like there's some kind of special words or formula that you can follow. But by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to flourish and keep, keep track of our vineyard. I'd like to suggest that as well as examining the soil of our own part in the vineyard, we have a responsibility in the same way that Adam and Eve were given their purpose to till the ground and to tame the wilderness around us, bringing the chaos back into order and expanding the kingdom. Because as Tom Wright says, the God who planted Israel as a vineyard is the creator God, by whom, in fact, the whole world was designed as a fruitful garden. So as um, the band come back up, um, I'll ask you all to stand and we'll pray. Father God, thank you that you sent Jesus. Thank you that even after you sent servant after servant after servant, that you as the landowner last of all, gave Jesus, gave your son, made that sacrifice out of the agape love that you have for us, no matter the cost. Thank you that you choose us every time. Thank you that even as we've spoken before about defeating the oppression of the Roman leaders, that also you deal with the corruption in the Jewish leadership. Thank you that now it's not just the Jews, but the Gentiles and us that are part of the vineyard, that look after the vineyard, that take care of our own and have responsibility to spread 
for this. Help us by your spirit to, sh- to spread your kingdom, to expand it, to till the soil around us, in our workplace, in our families, in our schools, in our colleges, in our universities, wherever we find ourselves, whatever our sphere of influence, Lord, would you be there walking alongside us, guiding us every step of the way? Would you have your way, we pray. Amen.